Well, good morning, everyone. Happy Mother's Day for the moms that are out there and all the moms-to-be and all the ones who want to be moms at some, some point in time. We, we rise up. We call you blessed. We're grateful for you. Uh, so thankful for all that you do. I want to share something uh, this morning I think is uh, pertinent to us these days. Um, when this whole uh, lockdown occurred, uh, I was interviewed for uh, a live video chat. And then uh, after that, our, our leadership were together. And, and during that chat and with our leadership team, I remember asking, how come there's no Agabus moment? And Agabus was a prophet who prophesied that there'd be a, a global famine, worldwide famine. And, and I, there was no moment like that. And uh, I couldn't understand that because I, God would do that. He did that before. He would do that these days for us. It seemed like there was no forewarning. I mean, even if there wasn't a prophecy that said there's going to be a global pandemic or, or a number of people are going to die from a, a, a disease that went around the world. I mean, there's no mention of that at all. Uh, he could have gotten our attention. And I wasn't sure whether the prophets were just so focused on who was going to win the Super Bowl, and that was what they were prophesying, or, or, or this thing isn't quite what it seems, and this thing isn't adding up to what is uh, our response, our government's response, our worldwide response, uh, what the experts were saying. And um, uh, I got thinking about this, you know, the Lord wouldn't have had to say much. He, he, all he would have to have said was, uh, in one week, every cafe and coffee shop in the world will be closed. That would have made us all sit up. Uh, that would have got our, our attention. I mean, if he had said, uh, in one week, every restaurant, fast food restaurant, every kind of restaurant, even including my beloved Chick-fil-A, is all going to be closed in a week. And uh, drive through only limited to drive through only. I mean, that, we, that would have got our attention. If he had said anything like uh, every sport from young people to national level, every television sport, even the future Olympics is all going to be shut down in a week, that would have got our attention. There would have been people who would say, God is doing something. If he had said that every... Every educational group from kindergarten to university in the world is going to be closed in one week. That would have got our attention. Nothing like that has ever happened before. If he had said every church, every synagogue, and every mosque in the world is going to be closed, that would have got our attention and would be closed for months. That would have got our attention. But the Lord didn't say that. If he had said something like, Toilet paper is going to be more expensive than crude oil. Uh, a barrel of crude oil, that would have got our attention. If he had said 30 million people are going to be unemployed and every small business is going to be closed in America over a six in, in a six-week period, that would have got our attention. The fact is, he didn't say any of that. And um, I think when the numbers shake out, and we find out more what went on and what this thing was about. Uh, it can unleash in people uh, because of that uncertainty, why this happened, who did what. Uh, was that necessary? That's being asked today. I think in the next short while, it's going to be asked even more. And what it can do is it can release rebellion and release a reaction, uh, what the Bible calls lawlessness. And lawlessness is saying, don't tell me what to do. I'll do whatever I want to do. I'll do my own thing. And there's a, uh, a lawlessness that comes when there's uncertainty, when the government responds uncertainty with, with uncertainty. Uh, when people don't know what to believe, they end up, they go to a place called lawlessness. And it happens all the time. And I was in my beloved Chile uh, just before this thing broke out. And I saw lawlessness. I saw people responding to a lack of response from the government, a lack of righteousness. And, and it, it unleashed something from the human spirit that the enemy jumped all over. And you could feel it in the air. It was a horrible, horrible feeling. And, but that's a response. That's something that comes out of um, uncertainty. 
So what I want for our people, what I want for our church, is I want us to be able to walk with certainty in uncertain times. And the only way I know to do that is to avoid going down the road of lawlessness and go towards the kingdom and submit more completely to the king so that the kingdom of God becomes more real than our government, more real. Our loyalty to the king, our, our getting our direction from the king becomes primary, becomes the first response. Uh, I'm not so certain that these days that people really have a very strong grasp of the kingdom of God, what it really means. But it's not, it's not, it's a different spirit, it's a different attitude. And, and the way to first begin to see this is going through the four gospels and watching Jesus, the king. And watch him navigate corrupt authority and, and misdirection by leadership and, and legalism. And, and watch him navigate being under Roman rule. And watch how he navigated that with a spirit of meekness that wasn't complicit and that what didn't comply. He didn't comply, but he wasn't in contempt. He was able to find that balance somehow that only Jesus could really lead the way on. And he was able to somehow say uh, to the people in front of, in front of the leadership, the, the, the um, Jewish leadership, don't obey what they do. When they cite the word of God, you need to obey that, but don't do what they do. And he said that to their faces. And he called out hypocrisy where it was needed. And, and he called it out in front of them publicly. Yet there's no malice. There's no contempt. There's no rebellion. He was able to avoid all of that and still be true to God and still be true to righteousness. He was able to get his disciples aside and say to them in private, here's how you navigate this thing. And he would coach them and say, don't, don't obey Certain things that the religious leaders were saying, don't obey that. They, even corrupt denominations today, that there's things that you just don't do. And he would lead them into a higher loyalty that he had with his Father in heaven. And that's why Jesus said in Matthew 6, 33, he says, uh, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And so that's, that's our priority. In fact, the word word, uh, the word... Um, First there is the word priority. We have a higher allegiance. I think what has to happen in the days ahead is our awareness of the kingdom of God becomes so real. It's more real than our constitutional rights. It's more real than our government. It's more real than anything else. And our loyalty, our submission, our meekness, our humility in relation to the king becomes so obvious to everybody. And we see this... Um, we see this borne out in the early church in Acts chapter 4. If you want to spend some time today reading Acts chapter 4 and Acts chapter 5, you see the very first test. Jesus led the way. He demonstrated it. I mean, Jesus mastered this thing to such a point. On his discipleship team, he's got Simon the Zealot, who was part of a resistant movement and an anti-government movement. And he had him as one of his disciples. He has Matthew, the tax collector, who worked for the government. And people just hate corrupt taxes. And they, there was a corrupt tax system by the Romans. And Jesus paid taxes. We see that in a little exchange between him and Peter. Because it was right. Yet at the same time, there's this corrupt, corrupt system of taxation. And uh, the tax collectors not just worked for the government, but they actually used the government laws to get rich themselves. They, they double exploited the people. So you can imagine how people felt about tax collectors. On Jesus' team, he's got Simon the Zealot and Matthew the tax collector on the same team. Well, the only reason that tension can be held in balance and check is they're both totally loyal to the king, which is Jesus. Simon's heart was given to Jesus. Matthew's heart was given to Jesus. And Jesus was able to satisfy both ends because Simon could say, I know this guy. I can see the way he's walking. He's doing what I would do. He's doing it the way he's saying it the way I want it said. He could, he could satisfy Matthew. He could satisfy Matthew's friends because they saw something in Jesus that he was non-resistant. He wasn't conforming. 
Yeah, he didn't stick out that lower lip with a, and, and strut in such a way that said, I'll do what I want to do. You can't tell me what to do. Don't tell me my rights. He didn't have that spirit about him. And so uh, we see in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 4, we see this borne out very early. Jesus said it was going to happen. He said, they're going to arrest you. Uh, they're going to come against you. And, and in that hour, here's how you're to respond. And so it's a powerful thing. There's a miracle in public uh, where a man who hadn't walked in his lifetime now all of a sudden was walking and leaping and praising God. And, and for hours, there was this public uh, celebration of that. Uh, the temple police came. Uh, the government leaders from representative the religious government, they came and they arrested the disciples and they took them in. And it says, uh, by what authority, and they questioned the authority, by what authority do you do this? And they, the disciples pointed them to a higher authority. They said, in the name of Jesus, we do these things. And he explains that in verses 5 uh, down to 12. And it says, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled. And then they realized they had been with Jesus I think that's one of the most powerful testimonies anybody could have. I think what happened is the Sanhedrin got in this huddle, saw these ordinary men who normally would melt under the questioning of authority and normally would melt and, and quake. And, and they saw them standing and speaking with such confidence, confidence without arrogance, confidence without contempt. And I think they got in a huddle and, and they said, who are these guys? They're uneducated. We can see they, they're just ordinary men. And, and the, I think they probably, and this is my read on it, I think they probably said, where have we seen this before? Who do they remind you of? We've, who have we seen that stands that way? Who doesn't comply, doesn't quake, but is so meek, so humble, so genuine, and they're talking among themselves. They said, we've seen this before. Where have we seen it? And someone said, well, they've been with Jesus. <laughs> what a wonderful testimony. They started looking like him. They started talking like him. There was no jutting out the lower lip and snarling with contempt. They walked in meekness. Jesus was able to, you know, when the king uh, asked Jesus to come and speak to him, he says, tell that fox I mean, I think there's a, way to, there's a way to speak. There's a way to speak that doesn't have contempt, but doesn't have a certain kind of respect for the person. I think that's possible. Tell that fox, I have got my own agenda. Here's what I'm doing this day, this day, and this day. One of my favorite scenes in a movie called The Band of Brothers, a television series that come out, is a series where there's a... Uh, uh, um, captain who had abused his authority and had really misused the men, uh, now met one of the men that he had abused, who is now over, over him. He outranked him. He's now a major, Major Winters. And uh, Captain Sorbel had been removed from authority by a higher authority. And there's this moment where years later, after a lot of combat, and uh, they, they saw each other. And Captain Sorbel noticed... Uh, major winners, but then turned his eyes away and tried to avoid him and put his head down like he didn't see him, but he saw that he'd saw him. So he spoke out to him. He said, Captain Sorbo. He said, yes, sir. He says, you salute the rank, not the man. He said, yes, sir, and he saluted him. And I think that's, that's a powerful lesson that there, there are men in authority. There are men in position who do things that are wrong, but we respect the rank. We respect authority. We respect authority, but we don't always respect what people do who are in authority. And that's a, an attention we'll have to live with, an attention that we're going to have to see in the next, next uh, season of our lives in a way that is uh, perhaps we've never seen before. The story in the book of Acts, it continues. They were uh, uh, released. They were beaten. Uh, there's a point where they're put in jail, and an angel of the Lord actually come and release them from jail and said, now go out in the marketplace and you preach. That's a higher authority. The Sanhedrin said, don't preach, don't speak in the name of Jesus. The angel said, go speak in the name of Jesus. Go out and preach. And when they're arrested the next time, they treated them very nicely this time. And uh, they said to them, um, who gave you this authority? 
And it's, a, it's usually that kind of thing. It's an issue of authority. And they said, what's better to obey God or to obey you? And that's, that's the tension. We have a, someone that we obey higher. Put first the kingdom of God in terms of priority. We obey God. But we don't do it in a disrespectful way. And he said, he said who do we obey in this? What you, you decide what's better, to obey God or to obey you. And then there's this wise leader among them in chapter 5 when they're arrested again. And uh, you can see this beginning in uh, uh, chapter uh, 5, verse 22. And uh, again, the same issue, like, who are you and who are you to do this? Who are you to break the rules? And then there's one of the Sanhedrin, a guy named Gamaliel. And he speaks up and he says something that's so powerful, it changed everything. His eyes were open. He spoke up and he cited what they knew, local history. And he said, you know, there's all kinds of men who've, who've risen up. And he described rebellion and he described lawlessness and people who were motivated out of their own uh, their own priorities doing what they wanted to do doing whatever they want to do and he says you notice these guys they had all came to nothing and he lists them by name and everyone knew who they were talking about because they had ro- rose up and stirred up the people and got a following and it came to nothing he said if what these guys are doing is is out of that kind of lawlessness He didn't use that word, but that's what he's describing. He says, it'll come to nothing. It always does. But if this is of God, you don't want to be fighting against God. You'll never win, in other words. And so in that, that was the relief valve that that allowed the Sanhedrin just to take the brakes off a little bit. And of course, as you keep reading in Acts, you'll see other, other instances of this. I think those tensions that we see here in the book of Acts... The tensions that we saw Jesus navigating, you'll have to navigate. You'll have to, you'll have to decide. You'll have to figure out how to do this. The only way I know how to do it is I have to submit to the king. I have to have an awareness of the king. I have to become like the king. I have to do what the king does, what the king would do. I have to follow Jesus. I would say spend, spend this next season deeply. Turn off some of the news and some of the agitation that's brewing out there. And, and get into the four Gospels and watch Jesus as a king navigate the tension and become like him so that you're accused of being like Jesus. Uh, before all of this, this uh, crisis began, I felt like our church needed to go through the book of Daniel, and I recommended that all of our small groups spend uh, the winter in the book of Daniel. I didn't know why then. I mean, it was just an idea that I had, I felt strongly about, had an appeal to me. Now, looking back, wow, Daniel's the guy. Daniel, Daniel's not of the world, but he's in the world. Daniel works for the king, but is submitted to a, another king, an invisible king. And he navigates this thing like nobody else. I mean, it's really an amazing. And here he is, a teenager, and moms and dads, we need to teach our, we need to teach this to our kids. The king sent down an edict that said, I want these young men, Jewish young men, to eat my food. When they looked at the food, they realized it'll make us unclean. It'll, it'll mar our conscience. It'll make us so that we won't be able to really pray and go before God because God forbids everything that's on the table. And some of the stuff that's on the table, he doesn't forbid, but it's not good for us. And so all of a sudden, he was put in this tension. And if you stop and think about it, it's a little edict. It's a dietary edict. You could say it's nothing. Just eat it. But Daniel said, he purposed in himself. He says, I can't eat it. I cannot eat it. I cannot eat it. He purposed in himself, I will never eat this. But watch him. Watch his spirit. He doesn't jut out the lower lip. He doesn't become arrogant. He doesn't push the food aside. He doesn't say, I'll never eat that slop. He doesn't do any of that kind of thing because he knows someone else's head is on the block. And so he navigates this whole thing brilliantly where he actually appeals and says, test me in this. 
Test this. Give me time here to test and see if this way isn't better than what you're, you're recommending. He, he realized other people were caught in the middle, and the, the, the Chamberlain said, my head's on the block. I'll, my, I'll, it'll be my head that gets cut off if you don't eat this food. Daniel navigated that with such wisdom because that wisdom comes from honoring God more than the king. And here he is as a teenager, and it's an amazing story where he appealed to authority. He actually laid out and said, here's, here's my course of action. Tell me if this isn't better. Test it and see if this isn't better than what your course of action is. Powerful. And that's in Daniel chapter 1, verses 5 to 16. A powerful, powerful example of, of submitting to the king, the king in heaven, and at the same time not being rebellious, and he was able to navigate that. And then in Daniel chapter 3, uh, there's a, a powerful story where uh, the king made this image. And it, and it really looks like there had been a prophecy about him being this, uh, uh, a golden image at one, in this prophecy that Daniel had given him. And now maybe that went to his head or whatever, but he makes this golden image. It doesn't say what it is, but we suspect it was him, an image of him. And then all of a sudden he put down this ruling and says, everyone has to bow down to this golden image. What a dilemma. If you can imagine a sea of backs, as far as you can see, in every direction, and three young men standing. When the trumpets blare, when all the harps go off, everyone must bow. And there's three men in the audience, three men. It reminds me of a photograph of all these people giving a Nazi salute, except one, yet one man. One man with his hands to his side. Just an amazing picture. And it's that kind of moment. And of course, they're arrested, they're brought. The king is incensed. He's absolutely livid that they did not obey, that they did not bow, bow down. And their response was such a righteous response. And you can see it in Daniel chapter 3, verses 16 to 18. And in their response, they said, God is able to save us from the fiery, fiery uh, furnace that had been heated up being heated up. That was the threat. If you don't bow down, we'll give you one more chance. If you don't bow down, we're throwing you into the fire. And they said, God can save us from that. But if he doesn't, and it's such, such a balance. It's just such a, a beautiful humility. If he doesn't, I want you to know that we'll never bow down and worship anything but our God in heaven. I mean, it's just such a powerful, such a beautiful, beautiful spirit course they're thrown in and God spared them God spared them because there's righteousness it's seek the kingdom of God put it first and his righteousness that's where you can't go wrong it was such a right response it was such a right attitude and of course Jesus comes down dances in the fires with them and they're saved and it's just the most amazing story and then the king goes and honors God by writing a letter to all of his kingdom everybody in the kingdom says let's let's all bow down let's worship this God he is the great God and God is glorified by our response God is glorified by how Daniel navigated that or the three Hebrew children navigated that Daniel's test came later in Daniel chapter 6 and there's this powerful thing where there's these men who wanted to bring down Daniel which happens in politics, and that's, it was a political thing. There was a political contest, and they wanted to bring down, down Daniel because he had been elevated and given such uh, prominence and authority. Daniel's using his gifts to serve the king. He's praying for the king. He's using the gifts of the spirit to serve the king. He's not anti-king. He's just so pro-God. Uh, and I think there's people who could even accuse us and say, and you guys are anti-social. We're not anti-social. We're just pro-kingdom. We're just so pro-kingdom to a point that it looks sometimes like we're not complicit. We're not complying. We're not simply mindlessly obeying. It's just because we're so pro-kingdom. Daniel was accused of that. And, of course, they come up with this whole thing that if you pray for 30 days, if you, if you do any kind of praying other than to the, to, uh, the, in this direction, what we prescribed, um, you'll be killed. You'll be th fed to the lions. And Daniel went home. He'd read the edict. He read the law. He went home. And he opened his windows. And he knelt down. And he prayed. Prayed in a way that anyone who wanted to could see him. And it says because that was his custom from his youth. He prayed three times a day. So what he did that's so powerful. He didn't become a hypocrite and said, okay, I'll show those guys. Now I'll start praying publicly. 
If you're not praying privately now, don't protest when they take away your right to pray. I think what Daniel did is so powerful. He just did what he always did. But he wasn't going to be intimidated. He wasn't going to comply. He wasn't going to do it in secret. He came and he opened the windows. And I think that's just such a powerful picture of someone who fears God. And, of course, it cost him. He was arrested. He was falsely accused. He was taken. He was taken and thrown in the lion's den. And it's uh, an all-time favorite story of almost anybody, even people who never read the Bible. They love that story of Daniel because his righteousness, his righteous response, his righteousness to God, his righteousness to the king. And then the king said, oh, Daniel, oh, Daniel, uh, did your God save you? I mean, the king missed his meals. He cut out off all the entertainment because he loved Daniel. Because he knew Daniel's heart. Daniel had navigated that thing of somehow loving the king as a person. And he was able to show respect to him but not comply. It's a powerful, powerful story. We also learn from Daniel in Daniel chapter 12, verse 3. says, those who are wise shine as stars and lead many to righteousness. I think that's our opportunity these days. I think it's our opportunity to shine. I think it's our opportunity to shine. Sh stars are used as guidance. And he said, shine as stars. That's what da Daniel's whole life was made up. Shine as a star and lead many to righteousness. We don't want to lead people into anarchy. We don't want to lead people into lawlessness or rebellion or any of that. Our response has to lead them to righteousness. That's the most beautiful thing. In Daniel chapter 12, verse 4, it says, In the last days that knowledge will increase and people will travel to and fro throughout the whole earth. And people have always read that as that education will increase and technology will increase. You know, you never have to prophesy that education and technology will increase. It always does. It always has. It always will. You never have to prophesy that. I think what Daniel saw was the body of Christ. I think what Daniel saw is in the last days, the body of Christ coming together, migrating to one another, one part of the body moving to another part of the body, and an exchange of grace taking place that was so powerful that the knowledge of God increased. Our governor this week uh, I don't know if he meant to say it, if he planned to say it, but he did say that, that uh, we really don't need the old-fashioned school of kids congregating in a, in a classroom and the teacher being up front. He said, that's antiquated. What makes us think that we have to keep doing that? Can't we just sit in front of a, a computer and get educated, get our information from that? And I think the same thing they could say, I've heard one official say, why don't you just have live streaming broadcasts? You don't need to gather together in churches. But they're missing out what Daniel was saying here, what Daniel saw. See, 95 or 98 percent, I don't even know what the percentage would be, but it's super high, of how we grow is through interaction. How we grow is through fellowship. How we grow is by being together. How we grow is as uh, globally he said, uh, I, see, I see travel happening and knowledge increasing. I think it's the knowledge of God. I think what he saw is the, the one part of the body learning that another part of the kingdom was suffering. And so they went and they helped and they shared. And when they go to, and they get together, the knowledge of God increases. There's something that something we get to know God when we're together. We get to know God when we're uh, seeing each other, touching each other, being together, just like kids develop. They don't develop from information. They develop from interaction. They need interaction. That's what our school system, uh, my life growing up, I don't remember anything, any lesson that I was taught, but I can tell you the names of all the people that I interacted with, that I grew from, that my, my drawing ability improved because of Harold, and this happened because this person impacted my life, and godly teachers, good teachers that impacted me. I think, that I think we're missing it if we think that we could just be isolated and grow. I don't think anyone can grow just staying at home watching church on TV. I think where you grow is through interaction with the body, both good and bad. And nobody can legislate that. No one can stop that from happening. It was prophesied that in the last days. I remember one time we were sending about 80 or 100 people out overseas on teams going to some of the neediest places on earth. And we were criticized. Someone criticized us and said, all the money you guys are spending on airline tickets, 
why don't you just send all that money, stay home, send all that money to the poor? Why would you go over there? Well, we'd already seen the faces of our brethren when, when we would show up deep in the jungle or deep in the mountains or deep in the desert, and we'd show up, and they, we, they knew that we'd traveled a long ways to come to be with them. And it was so edifying that they said, God hasn't forgotten us, and he has sent you, and you're here with us. And it's kind of like God with skin on. And, and I remember the response, and uh, that they loved the fact that we were coming. But this criticism kept coming up. Why don't you just send the money and you stay home? And I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, what, how do I answer that? And his response immediately was, ask him, aren't you glad I didn't just send money? Aren't you glad that Jesus came, he came in the flesh, came to be with us, came to touch us, came where we could see him and be with us? Jesus became one with us, and there's, that, can, that, couldn't be, that couldn't be done with some vast message in the sky. It had to come by contact, being together, being with us. And that's part of the message of Daniel in the last days. Daniel also prophesied many things about the last days. He prophesied about Jesus coming as the Son of Man. And he said, the Son of Man will come and judge the earth. It's interesting, when Jesus was brought up short by his own denominational leadership, and they called into question his claims and what he was doing, what he was teaching, and they wanted to know if he said, uh, the, the high priest demanded to know, are you the son of God? Are you the son of the blessed? And Jesus said, yes. And he said, you will see the son of man. He's quoting Daniel. He said, you'll see the son of man coming in clouds. And that whole thing, what Daniel describes is the son of man coming in clouds to judge the earth. And what Jesus was saying that's so powerful, he says, he could have said it this way. He could have said it very plain, but he said it in a biblical language. But he could have said, the day will come when you will stand before me as a judge. You better get it right. You better get it right. Jesus did it right. I'm so glad he did, and he led the way. He showed us how to navigate this thing in righteousness. I think our churches, I think our, 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 the body of Christ worldwide, but certainly here in America, because this thing can get so politicalized and become so crazy and become um, so uncertain. You don't know what to believe. You don't know what to do. You don't know who to obey. Obey the king. Put the king first. Put the kingdom first. Put righteousness first. You cannot go wrong. You cannot be misled. You'll know. You'll stick with him. You, you stay with him. And at the end, you can see. You can look back and see. And sometimes he'll even show you prophetically ahead what you can see. But I think the idea is that we really need to become more kingdom-oriented than we've ever been before. We need to find, that can't be a buzzword. It has to be a reality in our hearts. And some people in some countries... You know, it's, it's just funny in communism where they, where they don't want the church to be, this church is not allowed. They're tearing down the buildings and they pro prohibit people from meeting and gathering. Yet the Chinese government surprised me because I saw where they started inviting Christian teachers. They wanted Christian teachers. This is a few years ago. And they specifically want Christians to come to teach English all through China. And when they were asked about it, they said, well, they make the best citizens. Because there's something in the Christian, we want to obey. We want to, we love law and order. We love things done decently and in an order, and we respect authority. And they, they knew that they had the, the stick to itness, they had the, the right attitude. They want they wanted their children to be exposed to that spirit, that attitude, because there's no rebellion. And the communist officials were actually asking for Christian teachers to come because they liked something that they saw in them. I think what they liked was Jesus. They didn't know how to describe that. They didn't know how to, they didn't know how to put that in, in, in plain language, but I think that's what it was. What a wonderful testimony that is. We're tested. These are times of testing, a trial. That's the biblical language for it. I think the testing is of our hearts, where our allegiance lies. I want, I want Jesus to be proud of me my responses, my attitude, even my humor, my sarcasm, all of that. Jesus said, tell that fox. I think there's a place to actually say it the way you think. I think there's a place for that. 
Then there's a line that you can cross that goes into contempt. And I'm trying to keep my heart out of there, even though I see things that are political that bother me. You should be upset. You should be bothered. You should be incensed. There should be a sense of righteous indignation. You should feel that. There'd be something wrong with you if you didn't. But how you respond can go to lawlessness or go to righteousness. And go to, go to rebellion where you don't submit to anybody except yourself. Self-rule. Or you submit to the king and you submit to the king with all of your heart doing what he would show you to do. I think that's the most powerful lesson. So go deep, get in the book of Daniel, read it. It's a powerful, powerful example of two kingdoms, a conflict of two kingdoms, being in the world but not of the world. It's a powerful, powerful example of someone being able to navigate that. No one navigated it better than Daniel. You'll have to navigate it. You need to learn from Daniel. Then go in the four gospels and watch Jesus, watch our king, watch how he did it. Watch his spirit, watch his meekness, watch his humility, so that someday someone would say, that person's been with Jesus. I think that's one of the highest compliments we could ever get. Amen? Let's pray together. Father, these are uncertain days. Help us to walk with certainty. Give us a revelation, a, a vision, an understanding, a biblical understanding of your kingdom. Help us become kingdom men, women, children, like Daniel, like the young Hebrew teenagers who stood. God, help us. Help us to have that spirit in these days, in these times of trouble, times of uncertainty. Help us to walk with confidence in you. No self-confidence, oh God. Help us, Father. Help us to navigate this thing in a way that honors you. We don't lose our righteousness. Lord, give us wisdom. Help us to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Help us to know how to do that, oh God. Jesus, you did it. You told us that you wanted us to walk that way. Help us. Help us to know how to be both these days. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Well, God bless you. Hope you enjoy your Mother's Day. Kids, honor your mom like never before. This, She's been through a lot, and especially if she's been home teaching you or trying to keep your house in order during these uncertain times when we don't have all the freedoms that we've enjoyed in the past. This is the time to rise up, call her blessed, honor her like never before. God bless you.